Good afternoon, Campbell McCreary here, Amvest Capital, New York City. Welcome to the Amvest Capital Inc. Live webinar with Bravada Gold. Bravada trades on the venture as BVA, Bravo Victor Alpha, and as GBAVF, uh, Golf Bravada, uh, Beta Alpha Victor Foxtrot on the American OTCQB. Uh, we hope you'll enjoy today's program. It will be available about an hour after we wrap up at ambestcapital.com slash webinars. Um, Q&A is a real important part of uh, this, our format. And uh, so please send them in in the question pane there and we'll ask them. And um, all important disclaimer this call is for informational purposes only. Um, Ambest, of course, is a New York-based specialist investment management and corporate finance firm in the natural resource sector. Uh, I have with us today Jago Kizis, who is the president of Bravada and a professional geologist with more than 40 years of experience in the business and um, uh, had some some great places where he's worked and uh, uh, looks like he's uh, originally from Nevada, if I, if I recall. But Joe, if you want to share your screen and turn on your webcam. We'll uh, we'll dive in and we'll see everyone on the other side in the Q and A with Adam Graff, our senior analyst. Okay. And I see your forward-looking statement. Screen is working. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yep, we see it. All right. I should be able to see the screen myself. There we go. Okay. Um, so let's start here. So um, I'm Joe Kizis. I'm a geologist. I'm uh, president of Bravada Gold Corporation. This is a, a slide of one of our projects that we'll be talking about here in a few moments. But uh, you know, we are focused in on gold silver projects uh, generation to early stage of development, and we focus our work in Nevada. Obviously, we'll be talking about exploration, so we can't help ourselves but make some forward-looking statements. So let's uh, talk about Pravada and why you might be interested. Uh, we have a, an attractive portfolio of projects that we've accumulated over the last 18 years uh, in Nevada. Almost all of them are gold and silver projects. <clears throat> Excuse me. The premise of our uh, of our company basically is that <clears throat> new discoveries are getting harder and harder to find worldwide. But you know, by applying science and and uh, persistence and creative uh, thinking that we can make some new discoveries. So, you know, the way mining companies have evolved over the last, oh, I don't know, 30 or 40 years is that they do less and less exploration and more and more focus on the mining aspects of the business. Uh, and they are really pretty much two different types of, um, of business model. So uh, that's an opportunity for a junior company like ours to make discoveries and you know big companies are willing to pay a premium for the best of those properties that are, are discovered or discovered uh, um, you know projects that, that turn into um, resources and, and other um, you know other mining opportunities. So we focus on Nevada, and the re main reason it's uh, you know it's a top-rated uh, area. The, the um, uh, Fraser Institute rates it usually number one, two, or three. This year, I think it's uh, number one again. And uh, you know that's not only for mineral exploration, but development and mining, and that's all very important. So uh, we utilize a uh, hybrid joint venture model. We uh, we're happy to use other partners for uh, expertise and, and money. And in particular, ultimately, we would like to um, you know, turn these projects into mining operations that an experienced miner is, is able to, uh, you know, to bring forward. So shareholders can um, really take, uh, benefit from this in a number of different ways, either take over JV participation, uh, you know, maybe spin out the project as a uh, as a standalone company, or as a sale with a retained royalty. So, you know, we we keep an open mind on the projects and what kind of opportunities uh, we have to develop uh, shareholder value. Um, <clears throat> Nevada has a number of different types of deposits, and we really focus on two 
in particular, and, and I'll go through some of the reasoning there. Um, the Carlin systems, uh, as you see on the two pictures to the left, most investors are familiar with this uh, type of deposit. They're big open pit operations in general. Uh, they're evolving into some underground mines that are much higher grade as well, but they're usually pretty big operations. The other type of deposit that we focus on is uh, is called the low sulfidation. Some people call that a hot springs type system. And uh, there's historically, they've always been important types of deposits, but there's been an awful lot of research over the last, I'll say, uh, dozen or so years that have shown that these things are are are, um, are very well zoned. And really the tops of these systems, uh, which we found above ore deposits that are basically fossilized hot springs type systems, very similar to what we see here in the upper right picture for Yellowstone. There's a geyser center pool around the outer edges. And <clears throat> I'd be willing to bet that uh, at some depth, if you could actually drill the, that hot water, you'd see that gold is depositing and forming deposits just like the lower right-hand picture there, which is uh, from the Hishikari mine. Um, an Anza grade deposit in Japan uh, produced gold for you know millions, tens of millions of ounces of gold at uh, you know over an ounce per ton and, and significant silver as well. These are great deposits and they've been studied uh, pretty extensively now worldwide. And there's a consistent pattern where the center forms in the upper portion of the system, and then at some depth, there's boiling and gold deposits at uh, you know at, at sometimes incredibly high concentrations of gold. <clears throat> One of our projects, uh, which we've utilized this model, is, is, um, is called Highland. And, you know, we, in 2003, we intersected 12 meters and seven grams with some much higher grades as well. So this model does work. Uh, there's a lot of variation with individual deposits. And, uh, but it's a, it's a powerful tool to find discoveries that have not yet been mined and are entirely preserved. So let's take a look at why these deposits are important. El Pinon is a project that I was fortunate to have worked in in the, in the mid to late 1990s a bit. Uh, Meridian, now Yamana has the project. I took this off of their website in 2001. And uh, just to show a number of different features, and grades are very high. That means the margin is typically very good. Uh, they have a small mining footprint, easier to permit, minimal, uh, you know, minimal environmental issues. The ores themselves tend to not be, uh, you know, very uh, high in some uh, problem metals. You know, for example, you know, pyrite is not all that high, so acid drainage is not typically a big problem. Uh, typically not high in arsenic and some of the other metals that, that can be problematic. <clears throat> And you know the high margin you see here. This is uh, after they've been in production for a few years. They were producing gold at $43 an ounce. As I recall, their first uh, uh, quarterly report said they were producing gold at $25 an ounce. And and you know some quite new, uh, it's quite good grades. You know this uh, at that time was a new discovery at 17 grams. Uh, the photograph on the right here, which is also from their their site, shows what the system looked like over time. So in 1996, a uh, fairly uh, large, you know, vein zone, a little splay off of it. Turned out that splay turned into uh, Quebrada, Colorado, as uh, they uh, did additional work. That was a million ounces in a million pod, a, million, a pod of mineralization that was a million ounces at one ounce per ton. So a spectacular deposit, continued uh, exploration, 2001 and additional, and this has kept on going. So, okay, so that's 20 years ago. Um, how's this model been applied uh, more recently? This came out actually this morning from Hecla. There've been rumors that uh, at the Midas deposit, which is this area in here, this is the location of their mill. There's been a discovery uh, late last year. They came out with the news of that this, uh, just this morning. President uh, Phillips Baker said that you know, it's two miles away from the mine. So here we are, a mine that started in 1997, and they're still making discoveries 23, discoveries 23 years later. So these, these type of deposits are not only rich, and uh, I'll have some of the other advantages I mentioned, but uh, you know they just keep showing discoveries. So it's a great opportunity. The uh, 
so you know let's take a look at our portfolio we look at uh, our exploration and, and sort of a portfolio approach so we look for opportunities where we can discover very high margin gold and silver deposits uh, we're focused on nevada and you know when we acquire a project which we often work with with prospectors and that sort of thing so you know when they bring us a good idea we try to work out attractive terms that are both you know perspective uh, upside for them and perspective upside for the company. We're, right now, we have 10 projects, exploration and development projects, all in Nevada. Flagship property has an independent 43101 resource that we did in 2012 uh, that was positive. And uh, <clears throat> we also sometimes find something that is unexpected. For example, we um, discovered that we had a, a barite deposit on our property. We're not in the barite business, so we um, we sold the barite rights to that property to Baker Hughes, who has a, uh, a mill and they are actually producing barite ore for the oil fields. And uh, that's about six six miles to the northeast of us. So we expect that at some point in the future, when uh, oil prices continue to um, continue to improve that uh, Baker Hughes will again start aggressively uh, producing uh, barite and start mining from our property as well. So uh, that's what we have. Uh, Nevada, this is a slide showing some of the major districts um, and the amount of activity that's there now as shown by the amount of claim staking. So the brighter colors here, the hotter colors are significant uh, land holdings by someone and, and you know so there's a lot of activity in the area here so that's an important point same slide now showing our projects our uh, our uh, wind mountain project here our flagship property is, is located right here we started drilling last week on the, on our project and the highland is located here so these are the two that i'll discuss uh, today uh, we also have a number of other projects. There's low sulfidation systems here at Baxter and, and East Manhattan. Uh, these are more typical Carlin type systems. So our SF and HC project right here is a project that we plan on additional work this year as well. So let's take a look at our flagship project here, Wind Mountain. The reason it's flagship historic production, you can see two, a very small pit here, somewhat larger pit here. We've uh, established a shallow resource, basically holding up the hill here. Um, we did the, the, the PEA in 2012. Again, positive results. You see me standing there. We're kind of at the edge of, of the pit right there. <clears throat> Produced in the past uh, by Amax Gold, just under 300,000 ounces of gold, 1.8 million ounces of silver. And uh, we have a resource now of around um, all, all categories, something in the order of a million ounces and 25 million ounces of silver in the two categories here. Um, it was positive at our uh, at our $1,300 gold and $24 gold, which was the three-year trailing average at that time. So uh, the resource is fairly low grade, but it's reasonably good margin. So, you know, really the grade is important of course but then strip ratio is important very low strip ratio for the mineralization here as you can see from the last slide it's uh, basically a hill you mine off the hill and uh, you know that lowers the mining cost significantly past production good metallurgy so that takes care of a lot of risk there and uh, you know at the time Amax was mining it there was a very high royalty on the project which uh, doesn't exist now. There's a 2% with it right down to 1%. Uh, so a number of features that make it pretty attractive. This is the base case. Um, you can see if you just go up 30%, that's holding all the costs uh, uh, solid. But, you know, you see that there's a significant increase in the valuation uh, just based on on uh, on the gold price. So it's a nice leverage to gold price. So we, you do an, a PEA for a number of different reasons. One, to um, see what you need to do next. You know, it's nice to uh, sort of document where you stand at that moment in time. So that at that time in 2012, the red blocks that you see here are resource ounces that are in the indicated category. So that's the highest quality of, uh, of resource, you know, well drilled out. Um, 
on this deposit, there's another category called measured, but uh, uh, we haven't brought it to that stage. The yellow is a little bit less uh, um, confined. So as you can see here, one of the things you see is a large area of mineralization. When you look at the model pit wall, it's pretty steep on this side. So it made sense and something we did actually right after we did the mineralization uh, study here is to uh, do some infill drilling. So that has not gone into the into the resource category yet. You can also see that uh, even though there's not very much drilling in here, this is uh, it's got some pretty strong mineralization along this trend. So on top of those features, we look at the resource itself and what kind of distribution there is in the grade. So in this cross section here, you can see that uh, you know statistically. This is what they come up with here. So the reds are the better grades, and then it drops off in between uh, the areas of, of drill holes. The, that grade is about one-tenth the grade of this hole, this hole, this hole, and this hole. And geologically, it doesn't make sense. And so <clears throat> what we can do then is infill this drilling in here. That will carry the grade much better. And that's part of what, our, what we're doing uh, at this point um, in our drilling program that we started last week. So we're doing some infill drilling in here, and that's to tighten up this uh, mineralization and, and increase the grade a bit, we think. Uh, the third area that uh, we're gonna focus on is this area to the south here. And the reason for that is we think this is where the feeder zone is. So in other words, these uh, types of deposits, hot springs type deposits of fluids come up some conduit and then they spread out laterally. This is the material that was spread out laterally. And we've been looking for that feeder because it's often 10 times the grade of the, the lower uh, disseminated mineralization. We have a number of arguments of why the feeder should be in here. I won't go into all those right now, but uh, you can, see, excuse me, you can see that, uh, you know, there's not much drilling around here. so. When you go to a $2,000 pit, when you see what can, what can you add to the mineralization based on either you know getting some better grade in here or having the gold price go up, you can see that you know there's an area of potential addition of, of resources there. So the feeder zone here, we're going to talk about uh, in a little bit more detail. Late last year, we did a, a fence of holes across here, trying to understand the uh, geology, and what we found is here's the resource blocks that I showed you. And we did, did this series of holes here and a hole across here. What you see is that there's a large uh, block of basement rocks that have been uplifted. And we have geologic evidence that that probably occurred before the gold mineralization. We also hit a very high grade for the deposit here, very high grade uh, silver uh, rich quartz vein. Now quartz veins are almost non-existence here because the, the host rocks are so permeable that they just flooded gold all over the place. So there's a lot of low grade gold all over. Uh, quartz veins are very rare. This one had very high silver for the deposit. And you know you can do that in two ways. One, it could be the primary grade or you can get a little super gene enrichment. When we look at the drill chips, we see two things that are, are important. One is there's some hydrothermal alteration in here, or some hydrothermal brecciation here, which means that this is one of the explosive upwelling zones. So that's a that's a good feature. The other feature is that the uh, there's not much oxidation here. We can see silver minerals in this uh, in this quartz vein, so that's very attractive. And the next round of drilling that we're going to do once we're done with the infilling drilling is to come back and do some offset drilling underneath that vein. So basically. This is the hole that we drilled. This is the intercept. We're going to back off and drill it slightly under it in a place where we have more dense rocks against dense rocks here. So the vein had to come up through this, and this is a place where you can constrain that vein, can get the multiple stages of, <clears throat> of uh, boiling and, and gold mineralization. Typically in these epithermal systems, you do get uh, you know some pretty nice zoning. You know, there's high mercury up in the high part with, you know, relatively low level gold and also pretty anomalous and widespread silver. Uh, and then the higher silver values and the higher gold values would be deeper still. Uh, one thing we do know that's happened in there because uh, off in the hills just off to the west, we have something called steam heated alteration. That means there was boiling 
somewhere in the system and spread out and cause that alteration. Typically, you have to go a few hundred meters underneath that to get to the boiling zone, and that's typically where the best gold gets deposited. That's about right in here. So we're pretty excited about this. Um, you know, like I said, we'll be drilling this oh, probably in another two or three weeks, uh, actually probably three or four weeks when we get uh, back to drilling and we finish the infill drilling and take a break and then come back on this project. So here we are on our plans. We're currently doing this limited infill drilling. We're uh, going to next move the rig down to that southern part of the project where we'll do the, the uh, high-grade feeder drilling. And, you know, we'll do a resource and a PEA update uh, once we get all the drilling uh, assays back, which usually will take two or three months now with the way labs are backing up <clears throat> and then handing it off to the independent uh, consulting group, you know, as they have time. So that'll end up, we're looking at probably the first quarter of 2022. So one of the reasons we're doing this infill drilling where it is is because there's an area that has some of the best grade, it's right near the surface, and there's a heap leach site that we can put a limited amount of tons in. If we put those limited amount of tons and we're able to upgrade, it makes a really nice uh, phase one or starter pit. So that's uh, that's kind of the plan at this point. Uh, On to the other project I'll talk about a little bit today, and this is the uh, another low sulfidation system. It's a project we've had for quite a while. In 2003, we drilled this nice high grade hole here. Um, the surface values you see here, the magenta colors are over two grams per surface, extensive area of, of mineralization at surface, uh, a nice pod here. It's not very big, the particular pod that, that we poked with this, but that's another feature of these low sulfidation systems is that when you do hit them, even if you're not on the main structure and the main part of the system, they can really bleed some very nice mineralization. That tells you we're in the right kind of the system. There's general tilting of this, and so we're seeing deeper in the system. Uh, on the west side of the property, as you go on the east side, we're seeing higher and higher. And in fact, uh, we have a significant area of center um, uh, float in this area and some outcrop. So we actually have identified a, a geyser or a conduit, a fossil geyser off in this north uh, part of the system. Uh, recently, we recognized that there's another one down here. There's a uh, an intrusion, a flow dome, basically a volcanic uh, oops, sequence right in here. And uh, so we're pretty excited about this. We've just recently done a, a, a an earn-in venture with a little company startup called uh, Headwater, uh, Headwater Gold. There are some people from uh, Kinross that have gone off on their own, a lot of good expertise. and uh, you know, we're really looking forward to their drilling program, which should start sometime this summer. Uh, so we're in the process of figuring out where to drill, a couple of, you know, several holes in this area, some holes in this area. And uh, so we've had some pretty good news flow from, from both of those projects. Um, we're part of the managed group of companies. Uh, Hopefully I managed, I mentioned that earlier, but uh, we get a lot of our backroom stuff and support uh, through them. Um, you can see here the board of directors and, and the officers. And uh, one of the companies that uh, was part of the Manix group uh, is, it's a company called Western Silver. You can see it bumped along for quite a long time. Small uptick as they made a discovery called uh, Penasquito. And then of course they were taken over by Glamis. Uh, very shortly after that, the Glamis was taken over for this property uh, by uh, Gold, uh, Gold Corp. And then subsequently, they were taken over by New uh, uh, Newmont. And so Newmont is the operator, and they're mining that today. So, you know, a junior can be uh, very successful and, and make a lot of money for their shareholders. <clears throat> we're a, a tiny company right now. Uh, market cap of around $9 million. And uh, so there's lots of upside potential for the company. Some information here if you're interested uh, in further information, give me a call here at the office or um, some of our people up in Vancouver.
So I think we're good for questions at this point. Sure, sure. Um, dive right in. And everyone, um, copy of the presentations available uh, on their website, of course, and uh, right in the handout section and just uh, uploaded it there. So uh, you can get that. And um, where is the resource relative to the historical open pit and how deep is the current resource? Yeah, well, the current resource actually encompasses the, uh, the two open pits. So it's some of the material that was around those pits. Um, deeper than you know was was tested by the pits in part and laterally to uh, kind of surround the pits the uh, feeder zone is a little bit to the south of there um, so you know some of the mineralization and resource continues on south of the pits regarding the resource update plan for the next year do you have an idea of what portion of the resource uh, would be measured um, we're not really trying to get to measure it at this point. One of the problems with uh, the grade of silver at this point is that it's difficult to to get measured out of out of that because it's uh, you know that basically for silver analyses when you get up to 30 grams it's difficult to get uh, assays between 10 and 30 grams. If you get less than 10 grams, you know, there are methods that you can get accurate values. When you get above 30 grams, you can get good values. The deposit here, a lot of this is in the 15 to 20 gram range. So the <clears throat> the engineers that we've been working with have been hesitant. We actually did have uh, measured uh, reserve or resources that were in the um, you know in the original resource calculation we did but they did again did not give us values for silver uh, we we came up with the silver ratio based on what they produced uh, previously so you know that seven to one for every ounce of gold you had seven ounces of silver so <clears throat> yeah i don't know how uh, we'll, we'll have that argument probably again with the um, you know with the resource calculators they they said they'd give us measured ounces for gold, but not measured ounces of silver, and that's not something the exchange allows. So we had the choice of either ignore the silver, which I think is, is a mistake because, you know, for the PEA, silver pays for the, the mining cost. Kind of a long answer for a complicated question, really. That's okay. Uh, can you speak in summary of, of upcoming catalysts? <clears throat> Well, the catalyst, of course, will be, you know, sending in assays. So I'm hoping that what we'll be reporting are significant intercepts at shallow depths that is going to make that phase one pit idea work. So that'll be the first order of business. The second uh, will be the deep drilling on on the uh, feeder zone. And, you know, that's what we're hoping to do is hit the higher grade gold rich portion of that that uh, intercept that we intersected last year, last December. So, there, I mean, there was gold in that, but the silver to gold ratio was very, very high, very high relative to this project and, you know, not inconsistent with the top of the vein system. Um, excellent. How many holes are planned in 2021 to test the Wind Mountain feeder zone? Uh, the feeder zone will depend on what our costs are on on the infill drilling right now they're looking pretty good so we're looking at two to three holes as an initial pass um, you know even if we you know unless we hit bonanza grade you know we're drilling rc holes so we, you know you see chips and you can make some assumption you know assumption on on what you're intersecting but it's not like core where we're going to see you know visible gold or not likely that we'll see visible gold uh, I'm going to pass it over a little bit to my colleague, Adam, mining analyst. Thank you. Thanks, Campbell. Can you guys hear me all right? Yep. Sure. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, uh, Joe, thanks for the presentation. Maybe we could just step back uh, for a moment to give our listeners uh, an idea, a better idea of the overall business model. I mean, I, I, from what I'm hearing, Joe, I, would you identify yourself as a prospect generator? Well, you know, that has a connotation that, 
you don't do your own drilling. And to me, the best way to get data is to do drilling. So we will typically do early stage drilling, uh, stuff that we, you know, I kind of refer to as uh, as concept drilling, you know, proof of concept. So, you know, a lot of times if you do, you know, if you've got a great concept and you're trying to sell it to someone else, you're not going to get a very good uh, deal, right? So, you know, to me, people, you know, won't spend two hundred thousand, you know, two hundred thousand dollars on drilling, and you know, to prove the concept and add, you know, multiples of that in in value to the company. So, if you, uh, you know, we, we're not a miner. If we were to say hit something fabulous and we wanted to put it in production, we'd probably spin that out and and you know, bring in a you know, mining engineer and, and the staff that's necessary to do mining. We're explorationists, that's our focus right now. And, uh, you know, if we can do a partnership with a major company, that's great. If it's uh, a smaller company and that it's a good fit, you know, certainly consider it. But I'm hesitant to, you know, just say, jump in and say, well, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna start mining here. If we do, if we decide, the board of directors decide that's an appropriate thing to do, then you know we'll bring people in to uh, you know to bring that expertise. So you wouldn't call you you certainly wouldn't call yourself a, a miner. Maybe something maybe take something a little farther than a prospect generator would. Uh, and and just thinking about your your model and specifically towards Wind Mountain, if somebody would come and you would option that mm -hmm. property and and they would develop it and take it forward and and uh, and want to exercise you know fully their option. You've got a, a two percent royalty, uh, uh, or somebody has a two percent royalty on that property that you can buy down to one percent. That's correct. Yeah, that's Agnico. Agnico had originally staked the project, and uh, and then you know you would, you guys would retain a minority interest, and then maybe change that into a royalty. Uh, those are possibilities. Yeah. But, I mean, that's that's one of the reasons we want to keep a low royalty that gives us the flexibility. You know, typically we would we would, uh, you know, want an incoming partner to earn like maybe 70 percent. We keep 30 percent. And then you have the option. Can you sell you 30 percent? Uh, you know, do you, you know, play uh, participate at 30 percent? I mean, you know, it depends on what it turns into. So. The reason I don't really like to, you know, model ourselves or box us in as being a uh, a prospect generator is, you know, people tout that they just don't do drilling, and to me that that seems ludicrous. Got it, got it. And um, talking specifically about Wind Mountain, you know, the the PEA is for uh, a heap leach uh, scenario. That's right. And Front of mine. Run, run, run a mine heap leach. So, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 the reco and just just for my interest, you know, what's the what's the approximate recoveries on the on the run a mine uh, on, on the run a mine scenario? Around let's say sixty nine percent, I believe. Yeah, and that's you know taken from the past past production. There's a lot of early solidification there, and there's almost no gold associated with it. There's a bit of silver in some of that. But uh, most of the gold came later, and it's on late fractures. So basically, if you crack the rock enough by blasting it, it leaches pretty well. Got it, got it. And then, as you some of the deeper drill holes are 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 they uh, getting into uh, you know refractory uh, type ore that's not as amenable to to heap leaching? Yeah, you know, typically the veins are not oxidized in, in most of these epithermal systems, but the grades are high enough that, you know, you, you wouldn't want to heat bleach it anyway. You'd want to run it through a mill. <clears throat> you know, and an idealized, uh, you know, if, if everything works the way I would hope, we would discover a high-grade vein that's, you know, something like 10 times the grade of the, you know, the low-grade. The phase one pit would kick things off for cash flow as you you know drill out the the vein system and and basically put it together as a as a you know a milling operation for the quartz vein underneath it would that make sense to to float and send off to or or send off to uh to the Midas mill uh well you could i mean originally the uh you know amax 
even in the heap leach, because there was so much silver, they had a Merrill Crow operation. So they basically uh, recovered gold and silver with Merrill Crow. They took the um, you know the the material from the Merrill Crow plant and they sent it to Sleeper, and that's where they you know they fully uh, you know processed it from there. So yeah, there's there's certainly that that opportunity. There's not a lot of sulfide probably in, in most of these low sulfidation systems. So you know you wouldn't make a sulfide con, for example, and uh, you know do in a flotation mill and sell that. So it should be low side, a lot of quartz, you know, high well, gold. You think, yeah. So you you think you'd, if if you got uh, if you were if you would find you know kind of one ounce per ton uh, material or one ounce gold equivalent material, you think it's worth mm -hmm. shipping that you know all the way across to the minus mill? Well, it could be. Um, you know, there's not only the Midas uh, mill. There's, you know, there are other mills around. Um, well, you could send it to Jarrett Canyon. Uh, I don't know if they're still operating at, uh, you know, Kenross. Uh, you know, down closer to you. Mm -hmm. If they still have yeah. an operating mill there. Yeah, I. You know, I mean, ideally, it's enough to set up its own milling operation. Right. I mean, that's that's what you're is, you know, looking for is a small, you know, five foot vein. We're looking for it to blow out as, you know, you know, several meters of, of high grade material. You know, these can be spectacular deposits. Um, the, you know, the issue is, is you can hit a vein and if it has a grade, there's, there's going to be a lot of other veins. And so, you know, it. Uh, ends up being a lot of drilling that goes on but that's why you continue to make discoveries like Hecla has now after you know the boss has been out in production for you know 23 years you know same thing in El Peñon they're just continuing to make more and more discoveries yeah, I was thinking another another good example uh, of uh, a long-lived low sulfidation system is um, is San Dimas uh in uh in mexico uh is that mexico i think it's i think it's mexico yeah. now being now uh now held by um uh first majestic and that's been uh, yeah. operating for a long time just keep finding parallel vein systems yeah well there's there's a lot of them in nevada you know sleepers another one uh, fire creek heckler uh, has a number of those right now so you know, it's it's encouraging. You know, the the center idea is something that a lot of people haven't uh, really glommed onto yet. I think this will open a lot of people's eyes that you know these systems really are fossil geyser type systems, and you know by using some of the methods to uh, you know find out where the where the geyser is because a lot of times it doesn't necessarily um, you know crop out or you know that you know the center doesn't isn't exposed particularly well it ends up being you know kind of a gravel cover basically but you know some of the work that's been done by Oceana and uh, some of the people in uh, New Zealand uh, you know they have modern geothermal systems and adjacent to that there's a large system that is uh, produced you know tens of millions of ounces of gold and then you can take the fossils and the plants that are living there now, the thermophiles, and you can identify them. They haven't changed in, you know, 16 million years and probably 16, you know, <laughs> more than, you know, 10 times that amount. So what they've done is they've shown that you can kind of identify those fossils, work your way back and find the, the feeder zone. And, and that's what we did at, uh, at Highland is we used some of those fossils to say we were close. And as we looked, uh, you know, we we, we found the, the conduits, the fossil conduits for it. There's no gold in those conduits to speak of. Um, we, we found some float around there of some center that had been cut by a vein, ran a half a, half a gram. That's a lot of gold for a center. So these things can be overlapped by, you know, later eruptive pieces that, you know, bring some of the gold up very high to the paleo surface. But that doesn't always happen. Are you guys uh, actively staking a new ground based on that model? 
Um, well, we, we did that previously, yeah. As soon as we recognized, we added, added claims. And that was actually a year ago, but it, it took a while to, you know, to come up with, uh, you know, some targeting there. So these these current uh, projects, Wind Mountain and and Highland, uh, I, it, I I I was under the impression you've had them for a while, but are they relatively new to you? Uh, no, actually, the first project that uh, Highland is one of those first projects that uh, you know was was part of the what would become the the Bravada company. So you know we did that drilling in 2003, 2002, and we've had a series of partners that have come in to do various drilling projects uh, they tend to not be as uh, patient as we are <laughs> and so you know we've had a number of groups that have, have done quite a bit of drilling um, so we haven't put a lot of our own money into that project for a while uh, wind mountain we earned into by spending oh, a few million dollars two and a half i think it was with Agnico, this is a project I used to tell it to uh, Agnico, and and they had a, a they had this project. They couldn't get funding from you know the parent company. They asked if it'd be something that uh, you know we could bring forward and they keep a royalty. So that's how how we acquired that. That was in 2006, and our uh, our thought right from the beginning was this is the top of the system. There's got to be a feeder for it. Um, as we were doing our initial drilling to search for that, we discovered, wow, there's a lot of gold out here still. So, you know, that kind of diverted our attention. Gold prices were going up at the time and, and we basically put together the resources. But, you know, every year we do a, a little bit of work on the deep targeting. And I, you know, I'm pretty sure we have the feeder area right now, at least one of the feeder areas. You know, we still don't know if that's six inches of, you know, feeder vein or whether it's, you know, 60 feet of feeder vein. And so, you know, that's why we have to drill deeper. But, you know, as far as the model goes, it's it's working pretty well. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you for that, Joe. I'll hand it off to Erdy. Thank you. Um, do you know what was the uh, metallurgical recovery for the uh, from the old operation? Yeah, it was around 69%, you know, average, uh, there was, uh, they, they initially crushed some of the top of the deposit, which was a bit higher grade. So they had, I think, 72% out of that material. And then uh, a little bit less after that, you know, when they went to uh, run a mine. Mm -hmm. And toward the end, they weren't really, you know, paying that much attention to, you know, what they were putting on the pad, really. Mm -hmm. And when we look at this ideal phase one heat bleach operation, um, how does the oxidation, degree of oxidation changes when you go deeper? Um, it's, yeah, if you can comment on that, please. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the oxidation is a, is a modern surficial weathering feature, right? So <clears throat> the deeper you go, you, you, uh, you lose the oxidation. Everything in that uh, phase one pit area is strongly oxidized all the way through. When you get a little bit deeper, that yellow area that I, I showed you there, that's that's deeper. There is there's quite a bit of mixed in that, um, but we have oxidation even to about a thousand feet. You know, along structures in particular, and you know the problem with the mix zone is it's highly variable and and you know what what recovery you get. So you get near a structure that's got a little bit of oxidation, you can get very good recoveries. A lot of times that's where the best material, the best gold is. So, you know, it's it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. If the pit goes into the uh, mix zone, you know, there's, there's going to be maybe a lesser recovery, but, you know, if it pays to put it on the heat, then it'll go there. Most of the sulfide there is, is uh, it's not really pyrite, it's, uh, it's it's a unstable form of pyrite and it oxidizes very very quickly a lot of times in our drill chips it oxidizes in the 10 days that the geologist is collecting the sample and then bring it into the office we pop open the little uh, you know the little tray of chips and they're all oxidized <laughs> you know little little point sources so i see it's all marked so. thank you campbell mm -hmm. sure um 
Are you recognizing any metal in the waste dump? Well, the waste piles actually run ore grade in most cases. <laughs> so it, the parts of the waste piles, the, the mine waste dump stuff that was stripped, uh, a lot of that will go to the heat bleach if it's in the way. It's not something that you necessarily would mine specifically for that. Now, the heat bleach is another story. Uh, we've done some test work on the heat bleach, and all the fine material has been leached of all of its uh, its gold, you know, which is what you'd expect. The bigger fragments, though, because they were doing run of mine, there's a significant amount of gold, and, and particularly most of the silver in the deposit is still sitting on the heat bleach. So, the question will be sort of in the end of the uh, the mine life, is it worth crushing that material? Is there enough pad space? And uh, if you can pick it up, crush it, and put it on a new heat bleach, you probably get a significant amount of recovery of silver and uh, and also a significant amount of gold. So we're none of that's in, in, the heat, in the resource calculations right now because the studies haven't been done. <clears throat> like I said, we've done some initial studies on the on the existing heat bleach, we know that's that's a possibility. We just haven't, you know, kind of brought it to the stage where we can you can verify it. Excellent. Um, thank you. Um, I guess for this comment on valuation, and Bravada's been around for 18 years, um, and then we'll segue into. Uh, investment proposition going forward and why buy now and then we'll close sure yeah well yeah we've been around i mean that's what an explorer does right uh, yeah you, know, you, you find something and then you bring in a partner and if they bring it to production then you know everything's all happy you know we uh you know our we've done an awful lot of work on wind mountain and i think this to the stage where we need to Kind of show what that phase one pit is. I mean, that may be sufficient for someone. Uh, I, you know, I'm hoping still that the feeder zone is is really the money uh, for this project, and so that's why you know I want to drill. You know, I want to drill it, verify it, and if it's not there, if it's six inches of low grade, you know, we'll probably put Wayne Mountain up for sale for somebody that wants a small profitable mine. You know, our internal sort of what if scenarios is that that phase one is actually pretty you know pretty profitable but you know again do you sell off a, a small profitable mine that there's a limited number of companies that can make money at it um, or do you go for the you know the big discovery I think our shareholders want us to make that big discovery that's why we're drilling it and if the feeder zone isn't exactly what it is uh, that we're hoping for then uh, you know what we've done with the infill drilling is is make it more profitable to sell. Right. Um, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Manex Group. Thank you, Bravada, and uh, for all you great attendees, uh, new and uh, uh, to the story, and existing shareholders and past shareholders. Um, we're queuing you for feedback on your way out. Please share a few uh, lines with us. It'll get to Joe. Um, thank you and. Goodbye, everybody. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.